Testing two.
Yeah. The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to understand the threats posed by China's Belt and Road Initiative and review the strategies and actions taken by the Biden administration. Specifically looking at the role of the Foreign Commercial Service, State Department's Energy Resources Bureau, and the International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC. The role they play in countering China's coercive Belt and Road Initiative. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. There's no denying that the threat from the Chinese Communist Party is real. The tentacles of the CCP reach every corner of the globe as they continue to pull nations into their sphere of influence. Just this past week, we learned of a Chinese spy station located 100 miles off the coast of Florida in Havana, Cuba. China's malign influence is growing exponentially, and its encroachment into the Western Hemisphere poses a clear and present danger. Now is the time to act and address this with the seriousness it deserves. We need a, a whole of government approach, including a concerted effort among the State Department, the Commerce Department, the Development Finance Corporation to successfully counter CCP's Belt and Road. The BRI <clears throat> seeks to develop a system of PRC-controlled infrastructure, energy, transportation, trade, and production networks across the globe. The BRI initiative encompasses over 150 nations with a significant focus across Africa and the Indo-Pacific and a growing focus on Latin America, the Caribbean, and even Europe. This debt trap diplomacy is saddling developing nations with unsustainable debt, which China then leverages into increasing its influence. BRI initiatives often lock countries into reliance on PRC systems leaving countries vulnerable to exploitation by the PRC. Specifically, PRC uses its investments across strategic sectors to secure PRC exclusive or near exclusive to and control over dual use infrastructure and programs that can be used in conjunction with the PRC's military civil fusion program to help the PRC project course of power into critical global regions. Some of these projects include 85% of Hungary's largest ever infrastructure project, a $1.9 billion railway link to Serbia, will be financed with a loan from China's Export-Import Bank. Huawei has constructed up to 70% of Africa's information, technology, 4G infrastructure, including telecom, national and government networks, which have been used for surveillance of opposition leaders. And while China has focused on consolidating power, we have prioritized the $100 billion climate fund to help developing nations transition to clean energy and strengthen their climate resiliency, offering Palestinians $100,000 to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in arts and sports, and a State Department grant of over $20,000 for drag shows in Ecuador. How are we supposed to lead when this administration prioritizes green projects and social issues rather than applying our resources to counter the malign influence of the CCP? This must change. And I want to refer to a Wall Street Journal article that was written by the president of Uganda, and it's entitled, Solar and Wind Force Poverty on Africa. He says, Africa can't sacrifice its future prosperity for Western climate goals. The DFC was created, and I was part of it, to counter the CCP's BRI and advance U.S. security interest and transition countries from aid to trade through strategic development investments. We must make it clear that our assistance is designed to build bridges to prosperity. Additionally, the Foreign Commercial Service is prioritizing developing nations. We have 22 officers in Paris but only 12 in all of Africa. We are not showing up in Africa, and they tell me that repeatedly. We need to be on the ground and on the field, working to counter BRI and the CCP's influence. That was the intent of Congress, not to advance some social agenda or some environmental, but to advance private investment to counter 
China's aggression. And look at this map. And all of the green and blue are projects throughout the globe spanning across Asia, into Europe, into Africa, and into Latin America, over 150 countries now. For every nation FCS is involved in, the CCP doesn't just have a footprint, but a re regional stranglehold as the FCS is woefully outnumbered, and so is the DFC. Regions where the CCP, but the D FCS is not engaged, are ripe with opportunities for U.S. business. U.S. investment will further embolden our relations and strengthen these economies on an array of industrial areas, including, and importantly, critical minerals. And I find it startling that China controls a vast majority of global critical mineral refining. It refines 68% of nickel globally, 40% of copper, 59% of lithium, 73% of cobalt. If China controls a global supply of critical minerals, it will give them an edge in the development of advanced technology. And following the deadly withdrawal of Afghanistan, China is moving in quickly. The CCP linked a 25-year-long contract to extract oil and are negotiating a deal for access to lithium reserves that could be worth up to a trillion dollars. They are also looking consistent with Belt and Road practices, and it's foreseeable they, they're looking to take over Bagram Air Base. After 20 years of blood and treasure and sacrifice, this is how it ended. This is the administration's greatest failure. We cannot remain silent on China. We must prioritize developing our own supply chains where we are not reliant on our greatest adversaries like the Chinese Communist Party. Let's get back to the intent of Congress and what Congress intended to get private American investment to compete against Communist China. And with that, uh, I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Meeks. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking Chairman McCall for organizing this hearing and the witnesses for appearing before us today. This discussion is pivotal to how the United States undertakes a strategic competition with China because the Belt and Road Initiative, aka BRI, is central to Beijing's strategy to grow its economic and strategic influence globally. I want to start by talking about what we know about BRI. We know that BRI has increased the likelihood of debt crises globally. We know that BRI lowered infrastructure financing and negotiation standards. We know that BRI projects have extracted natural resources, harmed the environment, and undermined labor standards in many countries. We know that BRI has exploited corruption and poor governance and has created economic dependencies and political leverage that Beijing uses to its political and strategic advantage. After 10 years of BRO, BRI, this is old news. So I hope we won't spend today's hearing bemoaning all the things we know while simply admiring the challenge facing the United States, because complaining isn't competing. And to be able to be most effectively to compete, we have to know the terms of the competition. This is the first and foremost a competition about results. It's about how the United States engages in diplomacy, development, trade, and investment that leads to better outcomes for the American people and people around the world. Whether you're a citizen in Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia or Central America, you don't need the United States to tell you about the problems of BRI. You've experienced them firsthand. The reason BRI has grown into such an expansive global initiative despite these failures, 
is because it taps into legitimate development needs around the world. China has responded to the global demand for assistance, for infrastructure, and for greater trade and investment networks. The United States does not want to force countries to choose between China and the United States. But we must make clear that they have a choice. In order to do that, what we need is a proactive agenda for global diplomacy, for global development, and economic growth. We can only compete with China if we offer other nations a credible alternative. We must demonstrate that the United States assistance and infrastructure lead to better development outcomes, stronger governance, as well as better social and environmental outcomes for local communities. And we must leverage our partnerships with like-minded nations and multilateral institutions. So what does this mean? It means working together with our allies to resource the partnership for global infrastructure investment. That means making the mineral security par partnership more inclusive and collaborative. It means expanding and resourcing new initiatives, such as the partners in the Blue Pacific, who we met with in a bipartisan way yesterday. It means power Africa and prosper Africa. That means legislating an equity fix for the DFC to improve its capacity and its ability to compete with the BRI on infrastructure. One thing we cannot do is say we're competing, but then tie our agency's hands through budget cuts. According to witness testimony, China's trade offices outnumber ours three to one. And China spends more than $110 million annually in support of its companies at global trade fairs. How much does the United States spend? Five to seven million dollars? And of course, DFC's budget pales. It pales in comparison to the amount of money China is spending on infrastructure. But instead of joining in a bipartisan fashion to meet this challenge, unfortunately, when I look at what our Republican majority has sought to dramatically slash development and diplomacy spending, when I look at proposed, it slashes substantially development and diplomacy spending. That's a warning. We cannot compete with China if we don't believe in dollars for development and we don't believe in diplomacy and why believing is not just talking, it's by putting your money where your values are. That's how we make that determination. So what was shocking to me yesterday, according to reports, the House Appropriations Committee's top line allocations, the Republican proposal is worse than what I thought. It would be the most poorly resourced diplomacy because what they want to do is cut U.S. foreign assistance by 31%. It would be the worst poorly resourced diplomacy and development budget in a generation. And if the final budget aligns with the Republicans' proposed cuts, it would serve as a self-inflicted wound to the United States and a danger to American interests and global standing. And with that, I yield back the battle of my time. The gentleman yields back. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. <clears throat> We're pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this important topic. First, 
Mr. Jeffrey Pyatt is the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Energy Resources at the State Department and has had a long distinguished career uh, as an ambassador. Uh, Mr. Arun uh, Venkatra is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Global Markets and Director General at the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service. Thank you. And Mr. Andrew Hershowitz is the Chief Development Officer of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. Your full statements will be made part of the record. I ask that you keep your remarks to five minutes. Uh, I now recognize Mr. Pyatt for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the administration's efforts to strengthen global energy security and counter the PRC's attempts to create economic dependencies and coerce others through its Belt and Road Initiative. Prevailing in our economic competition with China and ensuring that the United States remains the partner of choice on issues of energy security and energy transition has been a priority for me from day one in the ENR Bureau. Secretary Blinken frames our economic relationship with the PRC in three words, invest, align, and compete. National Security Advisor Sullivan emphasizes the goal is to de-risk, not to decouple. And he notes that this effort extends beyond our borders and includes working with like-minded partners to advance our collective technology and industrial base. ENR's work on energy security and energy transition, including its congressionally funded technical assistance programs, are integral to that effort. We've all seen what happens when malign actors weaponize their energy resources. Russia attempted to do this with natural gas in Europe last year and failed, thanks in part to the work of American LNG producers. ENR is similarly engaged around the world to expand countries' options and counter the PRC's efforts to monopolize the next generation of clean energy technologies. In Latin America and the Caribbean, the United States remains the energy partner of choice, a message I heard repeatedly during my recent trip to Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. But we also see the PRC targeting Latin America for investments in critical minerals, energy grids, and renewables. ENR assistance in Ecuador, for instance, helped the government design and conduct the country's first ever competitive and transparent tenders for new generation capacity. And DFC recently announced that it will provide financing for a 200 megawatt solar power project that was awarded through that process, providing a strong example of how US government tools can complement each other to counter the PRC model. We also recognize that some of China's larger investments in energy supply chains are being led by ostensibly private companies with ties to the PRC. For example, in August 2022, PRC manufacturer CATL announced plans to invest over $7 billion in a new battery gigafactory in Hungary intended to lock in supplies for BMW and Mercedes. PRC investments in critical infrastructure in Europe create clear security risks, and ENR has engaged with allies and partners to facilitate U.S. alternatives. In Romania, for example, we're working actively with Exim and DFC on nuclear power projects to advance our climate goals and level the playing field for U.S. exporters. Similarly, in Greece, we work closely with DFC to complete the Elefsina shipyard investment that otherwise might have fallen into PRC hands in a country that Beijing labeled the dragon's head of the Belt and Road Initiative in Europe. We are also competing with the PRC model for energy investment and development in Central Asia. The United States has long supported U.S. oil and natural gas investment in Central Asia, and now we're looking to renewables and critical minerals. But the PRC has made some headway, for instance, locking in 75 percent of Turkmenistan's pipeline gas. Further east, ENR is strongly focused on support for a free, open, and prosperous Indo-Pacific. Since taking this role, I've traveled to Japan, the Republic of Korea, Pakistan, and India to advance our cooperation on energy security and renewables. I held an inaugural strategic energy dialogue with Japan in December and continued our important dialogue with the Republic of Korea, two countries that are key to reducing PRC dominance of clean technology supply chains. ENR efforts in the Indo-Pacific increase resilience against PRC economic coercion and dependencies. We do this by leveraging U.S. interagency expertise, 
including through the Department of Commerce's Commercial Law Development Program and DOE's national laboratories. Despite pledges to the contrary, the PRC has continued to deploy coal-powered projects overseas. In Pakistan, this has had serious financial repercussions because of its reliance on imported coal. During my visit to Islamabad, Prime Minister Sharif appealed for more U.S. engagement to support Pakistan's clean energy transition, including in emerging areas like clean hydrogen. After December's, December's U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, the United States pledged to step up its energy engagement in sub-Saharan Africa. With this in mind, next week I will travel to Nigeria to advance cooperation on clean energy and carbon abatement and to explore future energy partnership possibilities. The PRC owns mines throughout Africa and dominates the processing of the battery minerals we need to drive the energy transition. As part of our response to this challenge, ENR administers the Intergovernmental Mineral Security Partnership. In marked contrast to the PRC approach, the MSP aims to support not only developing countries' extraction, but also higher value activities such as downstream processing and recycling. The MSP works with our partners to identify bankable projects around the world. And ENR is also engaging with American mining companies to advance the MSP, as I did last month in Alaska, ensuring that our work supports growth here at home as well. In addition to diplomatic engagement, we will need financing to bolster these critical mineral supply chains. And that's why ENR's partnership with Exim, DFC and our colleagues working on the PGII will be crucial to the success of these efforts. We need to increase their ability to assist, both by providing more resources and reforming rules that unnecessarily restrict their ability to support projects. We should, for a start, temporarily raise the default rate cap that currently limits XM's exposure to default risk from 2% to 4%, as requested in the President's FY 2024 budget. In the case of DFC, we encourage support for the creation of a new $2 billion revolving equity fund to expand equity investments by DFC. In sum, the State Department will continue to work and trade with the PRC in areas of mutual interest, but we will also compete relentlessly with them economically, a contest where the State Department and our embassies abroad are key ass assets. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Vin Katranman for his opening statement. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I am pleased to have the opportunity to discuss with you how we are competing against China's Belt and Road Initiative at the U.S. Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration and more specifically in our Global Markets Business Unit, which includes the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service. My remarks are reflected in my full written statement provided to the committee. Notwithstanding China's efforts to portray BRI as a solution to advance infrastructure development and economic growth, our trading partners increasingly share our view that BRI poses more risk than opportunity. First, China's BRI can threaten our trading partners' economic development. BRI projects contribute to unsustainable debt levels in many recipient countries, as the chair and ranking member have noted, and these can position China to press for greater control over that infrastructure against the interests of borrowing governments. Second, China's BRI threatens U.S. economic and national security interests. BRI investments in infrastructure together with its transnational subsidies, have reinforced China's control over critical supply chain choke points. Third, China's BRI hinders U.S. companies from competing in markets overseas. Combined with long-standing anti-competitive practices, BRI has used its financing to open doors for China's state-owned or state-controlled firms, while ensuring those doors remain closed for market-based competitors from other countries, including the United States. In the face of these challenges, how do we counter the BRI and help American companies compete and compete to win? Our strategy for success rests on three pillars. One, pursuing market share. Two, promoting market openness. And three, 
preserving market security. We are, we are pursuing market share by aligning U.S. government export promotion efforts to help U.S. businesses succeed in sectors targeted by China's state-backed entities. Critical to these efforts are partnerships with the Department of Defense, including regional commands in Southcom and Indo-PACOM, as well as with the range of agencies that form the deal teams at U.S. embassies around the world. We are also intensifying our commercial diplomacy efforts to promote market openness by engaging with foreign counterparts in critical sectors and on infrastructure projects. We are using all the tools available to us across the Commerce Department and the interagency, often in collaboration, to build necessary, necessary regulatory capacities, increase transparency, and enable commercial environments in markets around the world. Finally, we are focused on preserving market security, both here at home and in overseas markets. We are promoting U.S. capabilities across strategic areas important to our national security. We are also focusing our efforts, including through our advocacy center, to ensure that China's BRI does not threaten either the reliable performance of critical infrastructure in foreign markets or the secure supply of inputs for U.S. production critical to our long-term economic and national security. In each of these pillars of our strategy, the Championing American Business Through Diplomacy Act, or CABDA, has brought focus to the importance of new partnerships among the State Department, Commerce, USTR, and others that has helped us collaborate and innovate in support of U.S. businesses in a more strategic and impactful way. We cannot speak about countering BRI or other commercial tools deployed by China without underscoring its resources. As Ranking Member Meeks noted, this includes China's trade officers outnumbering us three to one and spending more than $110 million annually in support of its companies at global trade fairs, compared to the approximately five to seven million dollars annually that our budget allows. I am thankful that Congress provided global markets with $6.5 million in FY 2023 to expand our capacity to help U.S. business compete. With those funds, we plan to open new operations in Cote d'Ivoire, Guyana, and Zambia, while making additional investments to existing operations in the Indo-Pacific region, Eastern Europe, and Central America, subject to approval of our FY 2023 spend plan. Moreover, the President's FY 2024 budget request includes a $16.8 million increase for global markets to continue investing in our workforce at a time when we must show up and show up often if we are to help U.S. businesses compete in markets around the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Herskovich for his opening statement. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, members of the committee, thank you so much for convening this hearing and inviting me to testify on behalf of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, what we all call DFC. A key reason that you all, Congress, created DFC through the BUILD Act was to offer a better and more sustainable alternative to the People's Republic of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Since DFC was established just three years ago, We've been catalyzing investment from the private sector and empowering developing countries. Unlike the PRC, we focused on helping countries take advantage of their own resources, their human resources, their commodities, so that they can tackle poverty, accelerate inclusive and sustainable economic growth, and become stable U.S. trading partners, all through private investment. DFC provides countries with an alternative to the terrible, choice many of them faced, which was to either forego economic growth or embrace the PRC model that required countries to risk their financial independence, to suffer the loss of their resources and commodities, to endure environmental degradation, and sometimes even to suffer harm to their local communities. DFC and its partners give countries an alternative, sustainable economic growth and empowerment. The PRC model burdens countries with excessive sovereign debt for projects that are often unsuitable or even unnecessary for local populations. The PRC supports projects with one beneficiary in mind, 
the PRC. The FC, on the other hand, supports private entities, mobilizes private capital, and builds resilient market economies, creating local jobs and building local knowledge and human capacity. The FC's track record investing in critical infrastructure demonstrates the impact that it can have. In Ecuador, we recently made a $150 million commitment to modernize a port, which will create 1,250 jobs and generate $750 million in foreign direct investment, private capital. In Sierra Leone, one of the poorest countries in the world, we've invested in providing broadband access to a significant swath of the population. We've helped increase a country's capacity to generate power by nearly 25%, and we're working to improve the country's main airport to connect the people of Sierra Leone to global markets and opportunities. DFC is also supporting projects that diversify supply chains away from the PRC, including for critical minerals and solar panels. DFC focuses on working with the private sector because closing the $40 trillion global infrastructure financing gap is beyond the capacity of any government or any public institution. We amplify our impact by working closely with development finance institutions of our allies and our partners, including our G7 partners, so that we can do more together. By working with like-minded countries, we give countries where we work even more alternatives to the PRC, and we generate new trade and investment leads for U.S. companies. Mobilizing private capital is an effective way to achieve durable development outcomes, allowing governments to focus their resources on other public needs like education. Our investments carry forward U.S. values of openness, respect for local conditions, transparency, and internationally recognized environmental, social, and labor standards. By championing these values, we enhance the long-term sustainability of our projects, we amplify development impacts, and we guard against the danger that projects will harm local populations. I've highlighted a few examples in my written testimony of where we're doing this type of work. While we're confident in the strength of our model, we know that we need to strengthen DFC's ability to counter BRI eff effectively and at scale. And to enable DFC to do more faster, DFC is building its internal capacity and aligning its organizational structures to meet demand in sectors where there are enduring needs, including infrastructure, energy, health, food and agriculture, ICT, and support for small businesses. In the energy sector, we're pursuing a balanced approach that recognizing that the PRC is competing aggressively to dominate the clean energy industries, while also recognizing there are circumstances which countries, when countries need fossil fuels to further their development. Congress and this committee have recognized the close linkage between development and U.S. strategic interests, and we thank you for your support of DFC. Through continued partnership with Congress, we're positioning DFC to be an effective, respected, and powerful presence for the U.S. in developing countries. The U.S. can compete effectively with the PRC model or any other model. Our model drives economic development in a way that benefits Americans and the people of the countries where we work. We treat the countries and their people as partners, and we advance the strategic interests of the United States. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Um, let me say first, uh, the DFC, the equity issue, uh, it is long overdue to be fixed. Uh, I am, I am uh, determined in a bipartisan fashion to get that fix marked up out of this committee. And I believe Mr. Barr is leading that. And uh, I know on the other side, Mr. Meeks. Um, let me just start by saying, you know, when you look at China, they are a for purposes of the United Nations, a developing nation, which qualifies them for World Bank loans at nearly zero to interest-free uh, loans that they then use to turn around and loan to truly developing nations at a usurious interest rate that finances this whole scam. They know how to manipulate global institutions. Then they get the countries in a, in a, through predatory lending in a debt trap they rape the rare earth minerals, they bring their own workers in, 
they take over a port or a military base, and then at the end of the day, if they default or they go into bankruptcy, the IMF bails them out. This is incredible. This is really an incredible story that is not out there, but they are really manipulating it. And when they're in 150 countries, that gives them power at the United Nations. 20 African nations vote against the resolution on Ukraine because China has them under their thumb. You know, I've been very invested in Development Finance Corporation. It's supposed to be OPEC on steroids. You know, I, I passed the Champion U.S. Business Through Diplomacy Act, uh, sir, and you know Keith Kroc really ran that office well. I was with him just last weekend. Um, but in my judgment, we're, we're losing this competition. If they're in 150 countries, and by the way, they have to sign a contract denouncing Taiwan, and they get on the digital one as a direct threat to our global current U.S. currency. I guess I've really got, to, I wanted two quick questions. One, you know, our intention was to get investment in these countries, private investment to compete. I was with a, a group of African financial leaders at the Milken Institute speaking to them. I asked, have any of you worked with the Development Finance Corporation? And not one hand was raised. I talked to ambassadors, I know the ranking member does too. They said, we'd rather do business with you, but you're not on the field. And if we're not on the field, we can't win. We can't compete. And so this has to change. And when I look at the president of Uganda's op-ed saying that this policy will force poverty on Africa, talking about, you know, only certain energies can be invested in. Or these African nations said, you know, we don't like you imposing your social value system on us. And that's not what Congress intended when we, we pass this for national security reasons to compete with China. And I'd like to hear your comments from all of you on this. And then my second question is the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, PGII. Uh, now, that was supposed to bring together all these entities. And I got to tell you, it's confusing. Even I think I'm pretty educated, but... You got USAID, you got MCC, you got DFC, you got Exxon Bank, and a whole host of about 17 different, you know, the needs to be coordinated. And it's hard to even know what are the roles of each of these, you know, departments and how do they all fit together under this one umbrella that needs to be coordinated in this, what I say, not Republican, Democrat issue, an American issue in this great power competition. Maybe if I could just go down straight the line you could address both of those issues. Thank you. Um, why don't I address the, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment first? I think it has the potential to be an extremely powerful tool for the U.S. government. And I don't, I don't know if you know my background, but before I was in this position, I was the, the coordinator for Power Africa for seven years under the Obama and Trump administrations. And we learned a tremendous amount about what it means to try to mobilize partners to try to advance infrastructure, having helped over 120 power projects reach financial close. It's challenging to coordinate the U.S. government agencies, but we did it very, very well, and we did it with strong bipartisan support from Congress as well. And it was a partnership where we, we sought input. The Commerce Department uh, contributed in big ways by helping educate um, African uh, uh, ministries about how to enter into power purchasing agreements, State Department provided advocacy. So we're working from something that we've done before, but the additional element of PGII is also bringing in our, our G7 partners. And so one of the things that we at DFC have been doing is we've actually been mapping out what each of our partners, whether it's France or Japan or the UK, can offer as an alternative to, to, to the to the BRI as well, so that we can find trade leads and investment leads for DFC and for one another, and we can step in when the other one can't be there. So already in the last year, when we look at PGII, of the $7.4 billion that DFC did in deals last year, 5.2 billion of those projects qualified as PGII. And so going back to your first question, of course, we're growing. Our, our, our portfolio has grown year after year. We're becoming more and more strategic. Um, I can talk about some of the other specific projects, but I'd like to leave time for my colleagues to discuss as well. Yeah, my, my time is uh, more, it's already expired, but if I have a Sorry. quick comment from uh, the, the two of you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Just to respond on uh, the work that we're doing on infrastructure and in particular uh, to counter BRI, one of the things we have at the embassies are these deal teams, which are literally interagency teams that work together, that harness the tools that each of us has. And the first thing we do is try to identify the early leads, the early projects that we are aware of on the ground so that we can bring them to the, the uh, American companies that we want to, to bid on those projects. We work with foreign governments to shape their tenders so that their tenders are open and transparent. Uh, we also push back on China's attempts to uh, drive single source tenders. And so we have examples where China has gotten into government to government agreements with, with our trading partners to require single source tenders for projects that would advantage China. And we have pushed back on that and been able to undo those single source tenders to make sure that American companies can uh, compete and win. And Mr. Uh, Pyatt, very briefly. Yeah, thank you, M Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the question about the strategic purpose of the DFC because I have a unique perspective on this issue. I was an ambassador serving abroad when you passed the BUILD Act. Um, I remember what an incredibly powerful impact it had on my work in pushing back on China in Greece, a country where Costco, a Chinese company, had acquired control of what is now the largest transshipment port in the Mediterranean. It made it all the difference in the world to have a positive offer to put on the table that attached to American values and American in investment. Um, it takes time because the DFC team has higher standards than the PRC does, has a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers, has to deal with transparency. We have environmental issues. <coughs> but I was just talking to my successor in Athens, Ambassador Sunis, and now DFC has completed that shipyard project in, uh, in Greece. He sees it as transformative in terms of the perception of the United States. But I also saw how once we put that on the table, China's hand was dramatically weakened. Well, so when I'm always asked, how are you countering China, uh, specifically Belt and Road? And it, it, it's, it's right here. This is a response. So we need to prevail in this great power competition. So we need to work with you to strengthen your hand uh, because in my judgment, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not winning right now. So with that, I recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, you know, let me be clear, and I think that we all agree that we don't want to replicate China's infrastructure model. We know that's not good. So we need our own approach uh, that plays to what our strengths and comparative, comparative advantages are um, to deliver the financial and environmentally sustainable development uh, that lifts up communities and facilitate trade. To that end, you know, we keep talking about things. How do we demonstrate to nations that our development and assistance, the models that we have, are better for them, as we know in the long run, and their populations, as opposed to China? How do we? First, how do we demonstrate that? So whoever wants to take it first. So, so at, the, at the most basic level, one of, the main issue, one of the main differences with DFC is that we're looking at the outputs, not just the inputs. It's not how much money that we're investing and how much money that we're spending. That's important because that moves capital. But how are people benefiting from that? Every single deal that we do, looks at what the development metrics are going to be or the foreign policy metrics, how many people are getting access to water, to electricity, to the internet, so that we can tell that story as well. That's not something that the PRC is doing. We're making sure that our transactions are designed for that impact. And we, we, we evaluate every single one of them in that way. And we're seeing huge results, whether it's in healthcare, helping nearly two million patients get consultations for the first time, or helping smallholder farmers get a access to credit for the first time. People feel those results, and that's what really makes people want to get the financing. Obviously, when we support a huge port like we're doing in the Republic of Georgia, like we're doing also in Ecuador right now, an airport in Sierra Leone, people see the impact of our investments in those infrastructure projects. There's a lot more we can do, but we're on that right path. So, and uh, I guess I'll ask Mr. Pat this question, and then I'll come. Uh, how do you, you know, again, we are in this competitive piece, and you're talking to these countries. And when you talk to them, how would you characterize the United States' comparative advantages 
and unique strengths in the sustainable infrastructure development assistance space going on what we were just talking about so that they could say, well, we want you, United States, because that's not, I agree with Mr. McCall, what he said earlier, most of them said the United States, you're not there to compete. We don't have an alternative. You're not giving us an alternative. And we need to try, so how do we do that so that not only can we say it, we can do it. So, Ranking Member, l let me start by thanking you for your reference to the Mineral Security Partnership, because I think that's a great example of what you're talking about. And I had the opportunity to join Secretary Blinken and uh, uh, Rita Jo Lewis, the chair of the Exim Bank, and, and Under Secretary Fernandez in New York in September when we had the first big public event to roll out the Mineral Security Partnership with some of the resource endowed countries from the developing world that we're looking to work with. And one of the most powerful moments in that event for me was when one of the African ministers came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I just want to say thank you for showing up because for too long we've only had one interlocutor on these issues of mining and extractive industries, and it's China, and, and you are giving us an alternative. And, and both you and the chairman use that idea as well in, in your presentation. So I think the first thing we have to do is show up. Um, we need to mobilize resources, and, I, and Ranking Member Meeks, I really appreciate your reference also to uh, the importance of the State Department budget in this context. Uh, I had the opportunity yesterday, as you know, we have all of our ambassadors in town right now, and um, I did a roundtable um, with some of our ambassadors focused on these issues of Belt and Road, critical minerals, uh, clean tech supply chains. And uh, one, of the, one of the chiefs of mission I asked to present was uh, Lucy Tamlin, our ambassador in the DRC. And Ambassador Tamlin made the point that today um, uh, her mission has two economic officers uh, covering all of the issues in that large and consequential country, one of the country, a country with the critical uh, endowment of the battery minerals that we are going to need to power our uh, energy transition. Um, the, the junior officer who covers mineral issues uh, is, is very uh, widely regarded. Um, and that position will have a gap of seven months coming up. So she'll have one person working on all of these issues in a country that's absolutely critical. So we need to resource the State Department, and then we have to bring things to the table. And this is where the partnership between our three agencies and DOE is so critically important, because it, it lets us bring to the table the strengths of the United States, our entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, the transparency of our, of our companies. And, and I have spent a lot of time since starting this job traveling around the world and talking to countries that also are being approached by China. And the answer I consistently hear is, please bring us more America. Nobody ever asks for less U.S. investment or less. Let me just ask quickly, because I guess I'm just about out of time also, or out of time. Uh, Mr. Vin, Vin Kataraman, um, how would the Foreign Commercial Service how are you building on the strengths that we just heard about or innovating new approaches in our programs and initiatives around the world? Yeah, thank you, Ranking Member. Well, first I just wanted to add that showing up really uh, in a lot of these countries means our companies showing up. It's important for our government to be there. It's important for us to be on the ground. But it is equally important, if not more important, for our companies to show up because at the end of the day, uh, as my colleague from DFC mentioned, it is the private investment, it is the private companies that are going to effectuate change on the ground. And so what we have done at the Commerce Department is make sure that we take what these projects are available on the ground, bring them to our companies at home, bring them to, these, to the continent or to other markets through our trade missions and through uh, other vehicles where we show them th these projects that they're aware of, we introduce them to the government decision makers, we provide the opportunity for the U.S. private sector to see opportunity where they may not be aware of it. And then these governments know that when American companies invest, they don't invest for the short term. They invest for the long term. And they are able to make change on the ground in ways that are long lasting and are to the benefit of those economies. Let me just say this, uh, and, and, and I agree with the, the chairman again. I go from company, anybody that comes into my office, whatever company is, financial institution, whatever, I ask them, are they investing in Africa? or in any of the emerging nations, I have yet to find one that say, yes, I'm investing. Yes, I'm working with the DFC. I don't find anybody that says yes to me. And, you know, it's puzzling. You know, we talk about the cuts, and there's no additions, you know, from the private sector. 
it seems to me somebody would say, yes, I'm investing. So I, I yield back, but I couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah, I think you see this is a bipartisan point of view. Um, there are 13 votes on the House floor, uh, so the committee will stand in recess until after votes. Thank you.
I want to thank the witnesses for your patience during that long vote series uh, and for staying here. Uh, the committee will come to order. Chair now recognizes Mr. Smith. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and for calling this important hearing. Um, let me just ask a question because our last two, Chairman and the ranking member, and of course, Mr. Pyatt, you did mention it as well, the importance of these minerals and, and uh, like lithium and cobalt. As we all know, they're two of the world's most precious resources powering the lithium ion batteries, which energize our phones, laptops, and EVs. Uh, stable supplies are central to America's economic future as the International uh, Energy uh, Agency predicts a 40 and 20 fold increases in respective demand for lithium and cobalt by 2040. The Democratic Republic of Congo, and I have been there, like I know many of you have been there as well. I've been to Goma. Uh, and we know that the, the mines are, are very seriously uh, being exploited by the Chinese Communist Party. Well, 70% of the world's cobalt is produced by DR Congo, and excavation in newfound lithium deposits will begin this year. Typically, the often labor-intensive artisanal mines uh, rely on the toil of an estimated 40,000 children, some as young as six, working 12-hour days in gruesome conditions, including exposure to life-threatening toxins, coercion, and physical abuse. Despite pervasive victimization, the People's Republic of China has heavily invested, as you know, in these cobalt and lithium reserves. PRC firms own 15 of the DRC's 19 mines, five of which hold lines of credit uh, totaling $124 billion from PRC state-owned banks. Instead of correcting the abuses, multiple human rights watchdogs have reported that PRC investment coincided with a significant exponential increase in injuries and deaths and the possibility of even worse cover-ups. Now, I've been working on a bill now for several weeks that I hope to be introducing shortly called Countering China's Exploitation of Strategic Metals and Minerals in Child and Forced Labor in the Democratic Republic of Congo Act. It's a working title. I did chair a hearing last July uh, at which we heard from uh, people from DR Congo and other human rights activists uh, who talked about the savagery that's being imposed all at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, so, you know, in the, many of this, this cobalt and lithium, especially cobalt now, will find its way into our batteries. Uh, and so I'm, what I'm asking, you know, if you could look at this bill, uh, I know that there are some initiatives you're taking. I'm meeting with our ambassador to DR Congo tomorrow. As she, I know she's in town, and I'm so happy to be doing that. Uh, but the bill would uh, enforce Section 307 of the Tariff Act of 1930, require the president to prevent an annual report to Congress on foreign persons found facilitating the exploitation of child labor in DRC, uh, mineral mining, or abating the evasion of U.S. importation laws, and a number of other uh, important provisions as well. And I you know, will share this with you. I hope that we can work together on coming up with a legislative uh, initiative, but I also know that you're concerned about this as well. Um, again, um, that hearing was an eye-opener. I've, I've had hearings on the mining industry many, many times in the past. Uh, but that one just blew me away to hear about these children who are dying, getting sick, getting cancers, in, in, you know, the inhalation issue, and then at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party, you know, the beatings that occur in order to enforce compliance in hard working conditions. Your thoughts, Mr. Secretary? First of all, Congressman, thank you very much for devoting so much attention to this, for taking the trouble to go to DRC, for meeting with Ambassador Tamlin. Um, just showing up, as we've all talked about, is of critical importance. And then the other aspect of this issue, which Chairman McCall alluded to in his opening statement, is the fact that China controls so much of the processing of these right. minerals as well. So their business model is to extract raw minerals and then take all the processing and the, the value addition back to China and then to control the global supply chain. We are trying to create, as both the chairman and the ranking member described, um, a better alternative. Uh, that's why we are, for instance, working with both DRC um, and Zambia on a battery MOU and a battery council to bring the governments together uh, to identify opportunities to bring back to Africa uh, more of the processing and the value addition and to create a real alternative to, uh, to, PRC's, to the PRC's role in this space. 
The other thing I would really like to put a spotlight on today, and you alluded to it yourself, is the critical important of the importance of these technologies to American economic competitiveness. In this role, I've met with Ford, I've met with GM, I've met with Tesla. All of our companies are chasing the EV marketplace because that's where consumers are going. Um, and China has used its years of investment in these upstream battery minerals resources in order to also dominate the larger story of electrification of vehicles. And, and um, in my prepared statement, I, I noted just the reporting last week from the Wall Street Journal, putting a spotlight on the rise of Chinese auto manufacturers, companies that most Americans have never heard of, like BYD or Cherry Automotive. And as I travel around the world, it's concerning to me to see how much headway these companies are also making in grabbing market share. So this is about strategic competition at the highest end um, of our respective economies. And it's one where we're trying to build partnerships and also working not just with the resource endowed countries, but with other companies that have a, other countries that have a similar outlook, allies like Japan, like Korea, like the European Union. So thank you. Thank you. I know I'm out of time, but we'll look to work together because uh, I think we need to have a united front on this, uh, especially with so much exploitation uh, and so much corruption. Thank you. Yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Sherman. Earlier in at the early years of this century, I chaired the subcommittee that oversaw, that oversaw what was then called OPIC, uh, the least fortunately named uh, organization uh, in American government, uh, since it sounded so much like OPEC. Um, we, I was able to craft legislation to reauthorize OPIC. Uh, we got it through the House, and I'm pleased that so many of its provisions are now in the charter of the uh, 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 Development Finance uh, Corporation. Mr. Chair, I uh, look forward to working with you to make sure that the uh, Development Finance Corporation is able to make equity investments. President uh, Biden, uh, in his 2024 budget, uh, includes a new mandatory proposal to outcompete the PRC including $2 billion of support for high-quality strategic hard infrastructure projects globally and $2 billion for a new revolving fund at uh, the DFC to boost equity investments. And uh, I look forward to working with you to make this a reality, and it will have to go through our committee. Um, the one thing I might disagree with the chairman on is I'm not interested in advice from uh, these days from the government of Uganda. It is most famous around the world for calling for the for passing legislation, calling for the execution of people simply because they are part of the uh, LGBT community. It was going so well. Yeah, it was just one. Uh, you, you like the rest, and I look forward to working with Mr. Meeks on our other committee to to push for the creation of mutual funds that specialize in publicly traded companies that, uh, based in Africa, and give Americans a chance to invest in private equity companies that will uh, focus on Africa. There are six big differences between how we do business and China does business. Uh, first, we're a coalition of our government, our allies' governments, and truly independent private sector companies. And even when you just focus on the U.S. government, it's divided between two parties. China's a one-party state, and when it comes to the independence of their companies, uh, not so much. So it's one entity versus a coalition. Uh, second, we're opposed to corruption. Uh, that's why we have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The Chinese are not only free to bribe, they do it. And uh, uh, it was a subcommittee in this room where I presented the letter from the outgoing president of the Federated States of Micronesia where he details how uh, uh, his, his people in his own government are being uh, bribed by China. Uh, one thing that concerns me is that we do almost nothing to publicize this, and I'm not sure that our intel community is really getting us all the information they could on Chinese bribery. Uh, related to that is we're dedicated to democracy and the rule of law, which puts us at a real disadvantage in appealing and making alliances with those who want to be corrupt dictators in foreign countries. We should have a strategic alliance with the peoples of those countries that would like to be governed by somebody other than a corrupt dictator, 
But of course, we don't publicize that we have a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and China has a practice of uh, corruption, so we get no benefit. Um, we engage in genuine philanthropy. I, I'm going to ask our witnesses to raise their hands if they could give me a real example of where China did something just to help people and uh, not for its own economic and strategic uh, advantage. And I see no hands going up to volunteer to answer that question. Fourth, we care about climate. China funds new coal-fired fire, plants. But I will point out for those who uh, like to see coal-fired plants, et cetera, uh, the biggest investors uh, in the third world in uh, fossil fuels are American oil and, and mining companies. And finally, while Ch China is crafty to make sure its foreign uh, uh, efforts advance its national interest, America not so much. We do almost nothing to publicize their role in climate versus ours, our role in on democracy versus theirs, and especially the corruption. And I have not in 26 years been briefed by our Intel Committee on the details they've been able to find where you can say, this Chinese entity bribed this foreign leader. Uh, if they don't tell me, they don't tell the world. And I'm not sure they're gathering it. And finally, when it comes to being strategic, um, as the ranking member pointed out, uh, there are those pushing for a 31 percent cut in our foreign aid, foreign development, and diplomacy efforts. That is not strategic. Uh, I do have a question, believe it or not, and that is um, China has these unfair loans. The question is, why do countries pay them back? Now, the number one reason to pay China back is so you can get another loan from China, but if their first loan to you was an anathema, that doesn't. The real reason I've been told they pay back is they don't want their bond ratings reduced. They want to be able to borrow from the international communities outside of China. So um, I'll ask a reaction to, uh, from our witnesses to a proposal where we would simply instruct the bond rating agencies that they cannot downgrade any country's uh, uh, debt rating uh, because they decide to uh, extend the middle finger in the direction of Beijing. Uh, do we have, is there a witness that wants to respond to that? And, and can you think of any other reason why a country that gets an unfair loan from China would choose to pay them back? Yeah. So, so I would agree with you that the terms of the loans are, are extremely unfavorable. And I think it's not only are the terms of the loans unfavorable, but they also lack transparency. And we look at countries like Zambia and Angola and the significant amount of debt that they owe to the mm -hmm. PRC. It's just absolutely debilitating. And it prevents the countries as well from taking on additional debt. And so it makes it challenging for us. It also leads them to default on projects where their gov where governments are guarantors and pushes them up against right. our IMF debt. So limit. is the answer so to simply urge the answer? Countries? My answer, though, is this would be a question for, for the Treasury Department and not for DFC to opine on something like this. I look forward to taking that up, and I look forward to our intel agencies briefing you, as I assume they haven't, briefing us, as I know they haven't, and in most many cases exposing to the world the details of the incredible corruption that China pays for and supports while we do uh, the opposite. It's time for the people of the world to understand that. I yield back. Gentleman yields. The chair recognizes Ms. Wagner. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our witnesses for their service. Uh, members of this committee were among the very first to sound the alarm bells on China's insidious Belt and Road Initiative, Xi Jinping's plan to extend China's influence across the globe through predatory investment, debt trap diplomacy, as we've just talked about, and outright bribery uh, and coercion. China is no longer hiding the fact that it seeks to replace the United States of America as the world's dominant power. Uh, this would be an unmitigated disaster for human rights, international security, and global economic development. Uh, America's allies and partners are eager for the U.S. to demonstrate leadership and commitment, specifically seeking assurances that the U.S. will remain present and engaged in the long term as they work to limit their reliance on China. Uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Venkat Truman, uh, how many foreign commercial service officers do you have across Southeast Asia? 
I don't have that exact number for you, but I'd be happy to get that to you. Um, the next question was going to be how many comparable PRC Ministry of Commerce staffers are in the same region? I can tell you it's a lot more. Okay, that well, that that's good to know. I, I'd like to know how many we have, and if, if there's a way to find a comparable number um, that represents that it's a lot more, um, you know, I, because the point is, is the FSC's Southeast Asia presence, is it sufficient to help U.S. businesses compete with PRC entities? I assume the, the answer is no. The short answer is, is no. Yeah. Uh, we, as you know, we, uh, the president has put forward a budget that uh, reflects uh, an expansion, <clears throat> excuse me, an expansion of the Foreign Commercial Service uh, precisely for this reason. And the Indo-Pacific is uh, one area where uh, we need to strengthen our presence to uh, do a better job. If you could get us those numbers, I'd appreciate it. Sure will. Uh, many Pacific Island countries are so small that they struggle to attract private sector investments in essential services like banking. Uh, again, Assistant Secret uh, Secretary uh, Venkatar uh, Tarman, um, are you concerned that Pacific Island countries will have no choice but to partner with Chinese entities to access, let's say, banking or IT, uh, any other critical industries? Are you seeing any efforts from the U.S. businesses in the banking industry competing for bids in the Pacific Islands, and how are you encouraging those efforts? Thank you, Congresswoman. And I can tell you that uh, I can't speak directly to the banking industry, but I will tell you I share your concern very much about American companies being present uh, and visible in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and we are already taking steps to change that situation on the ground. Uh, we, uh, in the past year, have um, added our first two permanent positions uh, in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, so that we have commerce uh, representation on the ground. Uh, we are looking very closely at what additional representation might be required. Uh, last September, Secretary Raimondo also announced uh, the launching of negotiations on bilateral MOUs uh, with these countries so that we could strengthen the commercial partnerships and really work on setting the right conditions and creating these interagency frameworks where we can make sure that the conditions are right for American companies to go in, and I would assume that would include the banking companies. Okay, well, as a follow-up, um, Assistant Secretary uh, Megha Tamarman, in, in areas across the Pacific Island countries where there isn't a U.S. Global Markets Office, but there is a Chinese Ministry of Commerce, you know, what are we doing to mitigate the gap? And um, uh, you said you've got the presence now of at least two, is that right? Yes, and Congresswoman, I should say that while uh, we are speaking about the presence of those two um, on the ground. Uh, the Pacific Island countries are not uh, in any way ignored by the Foreign Commercial Service. Uh, we do have a team uh, out of Australia that does cover uh, that region. So while we're, they're, they're not present in all of the Pacific Island countries, those countries are very much uh, part of our attention, and particularly as we negotiate these MOUs, they are top of mind. In 2018, China laid out an ambitious plan to extend the Belt and Road Initiative to the Arctic. Assistant Secretary Pyatt. Um, how well has China's plan been able to, how well have they been able to implement this plan, and is state tracking any PRC natural resource exploitation in the Arctic? Secretary Pai. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, I should note, as I said in my statement, I was recently in Alaska and had the opportunity to talk with Governor Dunleavy and some of our mining companies active there about all that they are doing, working with other Arctic states and dealing with both the challenges uh, that that region is facing because of a changing climate, uh, but also uh, with the opportunities, and in particular the opportunities attached to the energy transition and the tremendous growth and demand for minerals that we're going to see as a result of that. Um, I do not have any specifics for you. In, on you your don't question. know whether China's plan, which is very specific, uh, for, to extend their Belt and Road Initiative into the Arctic, you don't know anything about that plan? I, no, I am, we are certainly conscious of the plan. That is why we have been engaged as forcefully and as systematically as we have been. Um, and how it, is it that you've been engaged? For instance, our new consulate in Nook, uh, the work that we have done with our Arctic partners. Um, I was part of a conversation that Secretary Blinken's counselor, um, Counselor Cholet, led at the UN General Assembly uh, with all of our partners in the Arctic Council, other than Russia, of course, 
uh, to talk about some of these issues and the opportunity that it presents. I think we're actually in relatively good shape in this area, precisely because we have these partnerships. And if I can allude quickly, Congresswoman, to your question about, uh, about the South Pacific Islands as well. I think the United States' greatest strength in working on these issues and, and dealing with the challenge that China represents is the fact that we're not doing this alone. We're doing it with allies and partners. In the South Pacific, we're working closely with Australia, yep. with New Zealand. New Zealand, I'm very aware uh, of that. In the Arctic, we're doing it closely with our NATO allies, with, with Canada, of course, um, and as I said, with our, our, our state of Alaska. So um, we need to continue to invest in those kind of partnerships, and that's how we deal with the challenge that China presents. I'm way over my time. I uh, apologize to the chair, and I yield back. Thank you. No, he yields. <coughs> chair recognizes Ms. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to start with a question to Mr. Herskowitz. Um, one of uh, the mm. one aspect of the PRC's oh, no, authoritarianism no. that I find particularly egregious and troubling um, is its use of forced labor and widespread labor violations, um, which have, I believe, been very well documented. Um, and I think that one of the hopefully competitive advantages that we should have um, <clears throat> abroad is in uh, contrasting that PRC record with our approach to Sorry. not only affirmatively Sorry. embracing worker safety and, and, and rights, but also prioritizing hiring local workers, um, which my understanding is um, has not been something that the PRC has done although I've also heard that perhaps they've started to hire more local workers, per, for instance, in Africa. I may be wrong about that. Um, but you, in your testimony, right, while the PRC often brings in its own labor force on projects, even having operations manuals written in Chinese, the projects we support create local jobs, bring more people into the formal economy and train workers so they can build skills. Um, all of which help promote economic opportunities and prevent migration or participation in illicit activities. Can you tell us a, a, um, a specific example of this approach and, and how it's been successful? Sure. I, I, I'm glad that you, you brought up my old testimony because I was thinking that maybe they've been listening to my testimony and suddenly, suddenly they're doing some window dressing and hiring some more local employees. Uh, I spent six years living... Um, on the African continent, traveling to a significant number of the countries. And I've been back to Africa, I think, four or five times this year. And I always look at this issue and ask about this issue. Um, to give you a specific example, I, I spoke in my, uh, earlier about a project that we're going to be financing in, in Ecuador to build a port. And, and, and that port alone will create about, I think, 1,250 jobs. One of the things that's important to remember is that, that, that for U.S. companies in particular, it's expensive to bring your own labor. So even I always I explain to African countries, like, we're not trying to take over your local. We want to build skills. We want to have good partners. I visited a project in Burundi recently that DFC is participating in. Um, it's a solar array. It's the first. It's like the largest provider of power in Burundi right now, one of the poorest countries in the world. And I was really impressed. It's an American-Israeli company called Gigawatt Global. And, all of the people who worked at that solar array were local Africans. And so, so this is the model that people see, and this is why they want more of it, because we look to train and empower local staff. In fact, one of the things that, that we did um, early on with, with Power Africa is we created a, a program to train young women in African so, power and leadership positions. And we've watched how these women have gone into senior positions and utilities and elsewhere. So that's what we offer that the PRC does not. We offer the ability to have true partnerships, build capacity, and make sure that the people are running the projects are in control of their own resources and building that mutual trust. Okay, I'm gonna stay with you because I wanna get to another question. <clears throat> and that is on the impact of failed um, BRI projects, um, some of which have very publicly failed. And in some cases, like in Sri Lanka, um, the, their failures have even resulted in public backlash, as I understand it, against the Chinese government. We've con continued to hear about um, infrastructure projects um, that have had construction problems, are financially unprofitable, and added to the host 
nation's debt burdens. What has been the uh, result of those failed projects in terms of China's reputation at large and uh, whether it's in it, the growth or not of its influence in these countries? Yeah. So, so there are failed projects, and a lot of it's anecdotal, uh, but a lot of it's real. And I think there's been a lot published, for example, about the coca Cola Dam project in Ecuador, which has cracks in it. There's other hydro projects built by Sino Hydro that have cracks in them. And now governments need to fix them. Roads that are falling apart as well. Even the African Union building that the Chinese built uh, was, had all kinds of issues with it. So, so everybody knows it, and they laugh about it a little bit because they know that they're not getting the best quality, and they want U.S. companies. And one of the projects, and I, I know I just spoke about Ecuador, but I'll talk about it again. DFC recently approved um, a 200 megawatt solar project in Ecuador, which is a massive solar project for 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 Latin America. Chile's got some really large solar, but that's really huge for Ecuador, and that's going to offer less expensive power, and in some ways more reliable power than what you're getting from that hydro project. But but there are quite a few out there that, that, that are problematic. And it's causing significant reputational harm to the PRC. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Do you know what yields? Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Radawagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Talo Falaba, good afternoon. I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to focus on some of the loans that the PRC is making to small nations and just following up on Ms. Wagner's question about Pacific Island nations and thank you for mentioning that. Uh, about a week and a half ago I was in independent Samoa and their airport was built using BRI funds. Now when my good friend Prime Minister Afiyonga Fiume Naomi Mata'afa was elected to lead independent Samoa she canceled many of these BRI projects in independent Samoa before they actually destroyed Samoa's economy. So Mr. Herkowitz, my first question is for you. There have been reports and trends that PRC investment into BRI is suffering due to their heavy saturation of loans. Has DFC outlined or explored any plans to capitalize on this opportunity? And if so, can you share some of the details? So DFC is an important tool for the US government in trying to provide support in the Pacific Islands. It's a challenging place to work, as has been highlighted, because a lot of the economies are quite small. Um, and so we're even looking at how we can support uh, some of the islands on a regional basis. I met with one of the ministers from Tuvalu recently at the um, at the Least Developed Countries Conference and just talking about what we can do. And it's such a small population there. And we're looking at if there are ways for us to support even the development banks in that country, or at least a regional development bank. Uh, a significant project, though, and I think one of my colleagues mentioned that, it's been mentioned, our collaboration with partners who are very active in the region, like Australia, um, like Japan, um, was the work that we've just done in Papua New Guinea to um, uh, basically upgrade a 5G network, which, which outbid a Chinese bidder as well. And that was collaboration with, uh, with the Japanese government and Australian government. So we're constantly looking for these types of opportunities, but there's always more we can all do. Thank you. And as a follow-up, and you can all answer, but I may not have enough time, uh, can any of you share all the current bids for strategic projects that are ports, undersea cables, and telecommunications systems? I don't think we have a, that. You have, I don't know if Commerce tracks this. We want to think, go ahead, I'll, let, I'll defer to you first. Yeah, I can't provide an answer on that right now. We'd be happy to look into it. We might have some information that's on point, um, or at least gets us close to some of that information that our deal teams might be tracking, but we'd be happy to follow up. Mr. Secretary? So I, I think what I would highlight in this area in particular are the opportunities around new energy technologies. And as, as Andy pointed out, uh, these are very small economies. Um, most of their power historically, as you know, has come from diesel generator systems that aren't very, very clean. But now the technology is evolving, and so we're working with partners, including both DFC but also with American companies. <coughs> Uh, I should also point out that I was very pleased that um, earlier this year, one of my 
deputies, uh, our deputy assistant secretary, uh, Laura Lockman, uh, was in the Pacific Islands talking about exactly these issues of technological opportunity, but also trying to build partnerships. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. General A yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for uh, sharing your perspective today. Um, Assistant Secretary Hyatt, it's good to see you. I last saw you in Greece, seems like forever ago, uh, but uh, it, it's good to be here. And, um, obviously, what we're talking about is a, a critical issue in making sure the United States maintains its, its leadership role and, and are able to stand up against the PRI. I want to kind of walk through a intellectual exercise for a, a, a second, though. If there was no Belt and Road Initiative, what would be our international priorities with, within the context of, of building relationships and assuring U.S. alliances? And maybe, Mr. Herskovitz, I'll start with you. So I would start by saying that prior to the Belt and Road Initiative, the U.S. government has for a long time invested a significant amount in developing countries going back to the Marshall Plan and doing it for the right reasons, because we see developing countries as our partners, and we see that it benefits Americans when the countries throughout the world are in a better place economically and that people are well-educated, they have access to health care. So whether it was through USAID or OPIC or DFC, the work that we've been doing has been building the partnerships that we've had, and it's helped build the reputation of the United States to where it is internationally today. We can continue to do more, but I would just submit that we would We've been doing this work, and we can do more, and we can do it better. Uh, Assistant Secretary Venkta Raman. Yeah, I would just echo that to say that our focus, uh, even without Belt and Road, would be on the emerging markets where uh, that is the locus of economic growth. That is where U.S. business uh, sees a significant opportunity. That's where the middle classes are growing, and uh, that's where we would be still. And Assistant Secretary Pyatt. On the energy and climate issues that I'm responsible for, Congressman, um, much is guided by the priorities that Secretary Blinken has given us. The top of that list is the competition with our two great adversaries, the PRC and, and, and Russia. And then another critically important consideration, again, in the energy and climate space is the large developing countries that are going to have such a decisive impact on how successful we are in managing the climate crisis. So India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, Nigeria, where I'm traveling this weekend, um, Indonesia. Um, these are of critical importance. And then also, I would say, influenced significantly by what we hear from Congress and the priorities that this committee and the Foreign Relations Committee give us in terms of areas of particular focus. And, and I was looking at some of the numbers and the materials we had in preparing for this um, hearing. And, and it struck me, uh, our direct investment, foreign direct investment of China, over the 20 years, 2001 to 2021, grew from 34 billion to 2.6 trillion, a, a, a seven, 76 times uh, increment. Uh, the United States is still significantly larger. We're at 9.8 trillion dollars FDI in uh, uh, 2021, four times China's. But our relative share of the global total has dropped from uh, 32 to 23 percent. But I think. One of our superpowers as a nation is our alliances. We've talked a little bit about this here, is our ability to, to bring others together. And I think each of you have, have talked about this, of how we working with others and, and uh, the relationships we build with the countries we partner with and the, and the countries we're investing in. Um, and the reason I asked about what if there was no Belt and Road, I think there's overlap. Even if China wasn't doing what it was doing, we would still be doing what we are doing. Uh, because it serves our interests. It, it serves our, our national interest, our strategic interests are, are served making sure that China doesn't uh, continue to grow. Um, in, in the minute we have left, and, and maybe I'll start with Assistant Secretary Pyatt coming the, the other direction, what are the most important things? You mentioned the role or positions coming out of Congress. What do we have to make sure that we address and what do we need to say or do to make sure that you all are successful, the United States continues to be successful you know, on the global stage? So, Congressman, if, if I can just circle back to Ranking Member Meeks's point, and, and that we had a powerful presentation yesterday to our ambassadors, um, also uh, from Senator Coons um, and Senator Graham, who talked a little bit from the Senate side, their perspectives on where the budget debate 
stands and, and the potential repercussions uh, for the State Department's operational budget. And, and so I think giving us the resources that we need, and as I said earlier, I was so grateful to hear about the engagement with uh, Ambassador Tamlin in, in DRC, which is a critically important country in this energy transition game. Um, but it's also an, an embassy that's operating right at the fringes in terms of their uh, operational effectiveness for resource reasons. Anybody else? I just wanted to add that one of the most powerful changes that I thought took place when, when DFC was established in contrast with OPIC is opening up the ability for DFC to work not only with U.S. companies. And, and what that's done is it's opened the door for us to work with companies from both local companies from a development standpoint, you build long-term sustainability, but with like-minded partners as well. And the reason why intuitively it seems like that doesn't favor U.S. companies, it actually does, because when we're in on a project early, it gives us an opportunity to find out who the EPC contractor is going to be, who the vendors are going to be, so that we can then pass trade leads on the Commerce Department so that U.S. companies can get in there. OPIC had a vast majority of its business with a relatively small number of companies. I'm really proud of the fact that over the last three years, DFC's added at least, I think, 200 or so new clients. And I think that's really making a big difference in terms of our collaboration with like-minded partners and making sure that the U.S. has some touch in terms of what's going on in countries. Thank you. I don't want to I'm not over time, but if, with permission, if you want to add anything or... You know, very briefly, okay, we have, sorry. A, <clears throat> we have I, a congressional baseball game tonight. I, um, <laughs> thank you for the extra time, and, and, and Chairman McCall, thank you for having this hearing. This is a critical issue that we need to stay united in, in a single voice here. Thank you very much. Now, gentleman Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Davidson. Thank the Chairman. Thank the witnesses. I appreciate you guys being here and uh, the work that you're uh, at least fo supposed to focus on. Uh, hopefully, we'll find 100 percent alignment. Uh, does the administration assess that our partners and allies in the Western Hemisphere are in alignment with the United States on the need to address the threats posed by China? Thank you, Congressman. I think there are different perspectives uh, throughout the hemisphere uh, on, this, on this question. I think uh, what we hear most often is that uh, uh, our trading partners We'll look to China for assistance with certain projects and for that investment that does come from China. Uh, um, but it is also the case that uh, many of our trading partners in the region do understand uh, some of the risks associated with that investment or with uh, that. I mean, it's of. great that they understand the risks, but nevertheless, they don't assess China as a significant threat. They're continuing to actually increase their ties with the United with China and in some cases diminish their ties with the United States. Uh, I'm glad you recognize that and acknowledge it. I guess my concern is that the administration seems okay with it. Uh, and, and I'll point out that during a, a background press call on the Summit of the Americas, a senior White House official said, quote, any country that is investing in the economic prosperity, security, and social well-being of the countries of the region are advancing U.S. national security interests and are welcome as far as we're concerned. That doesn't sound like there is a, a policy from the United States to counter China's influence. It seems like it's inviting it. Like, hey, I don't know, if you're going to invest and grow the economy here, come on over. Uh, that's concerning. This official also quoted National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who said on a previous occasion, quote, we're not asking the countries of the region to choose between the United States and China. Is it the policy of the Biden administration to permit the Chinese Communist Party to expand their malign influence in the Western Hemisphere? Is that a policy position? Congressman, I would just say that we spend every day pushing back on that. That is what we do with our American companies. We provide these governments in the region with an alternative to uh, what is presented by China. So we are not in the business of standing back and letting China take over the, the Western Hemisphere with their investments. Mr. Pyatt? Congressman, the policy of the United States is to invest, align, and compete. And we're competing every single day with the PRC, including here in the Western Hemisphere. I mentioned earlier my travel recently to Guyana, a small developing country that has just discovered 
11 billion barrels equivalent of oil and gas. Um, the conversations I had there, everybody used the phrase that China was a partner of necessity, not a partner of choice. There was great appreciation for the fact that I was there, the most senior U.S. official to go to that country in a long time. Thank you. Mr. Hershkowitz? It's part of DFC's mandate, a key part of our mandate to counter malign influence and to use private sector solutions to advance development in the strategic interests of the United States. Is China's influence malign? Absolutely. All right. I'm glad we agree. Uh, this is encouraging because uh, some of the statements, as I say, lends credibility to the idea that the Biden administration, Biden administration may not have a formal policy that's okay with the Chinese Communist Party growing their influence in the uh, Central and South America and the Western Hemisphere. It's certainly happening. It is happening, right? I mean, China's influence in the region is growing, right? Does anyone disagree with that? Everyone agrees? So we're not succeeding, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, I'm concerned about that. Uh, I'll just close on natural resources. Control of natural resources is critical uh, to maintain power and leverage, and the People's Republic of China has choke points and limitations on some of these. Uh, you know, you mentioned Guyana, but we're also concerned about rare earth minerals uh, and, uh, you know, maybe not quite rare earth, whether you're talking around the world, cobalt, lithium, the things that are going, frankly, out of the Green New Deal that the Biden administration loves, uh, they're driving uh, investment into China, uh, into areas that China has garnered market. So when you look inside the Western Hemisphere, um, are our policies effectively allowing China's influence to grow, or are we doing things to counter it? Congressman, we're, we're working very hard to counter it, including with the lithium triangle countries that you alluded to, uh, working with Argentina, working with Chile, um, working here in the, in the near neighborhood, including, of course, with, with Mexico. Um, so our, our intent is to respond to the opportunities that the energy transition represents. And I would suggest to you, Congressman, that um, the growth and demand that we're seeing for those battery minerals is not coming so much because of any government's policy. It's coming because of consumer choice. And that's certainly what I hear when I talk to Ford or General that's Motors. an interesting perspective. I yield my time. Gentleman Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Castro. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank all of you for your testimony today and for being with us. Uh, I've often said that the United States should engage in competition with China when necessary, prioritize our sources of strength at home, and provide funding to countries that need our support. The United States has an opportunity to present ourselves as a viable and better partner for the realities many nations face. To succeed, the United States must regain confidence with other countries and discourage actions that undermine agreed norms. So in other words, competition between the United States and China should be fair. Uh, China should be able to compete with the United States without cheating the world. And the Development Finance Corporation is a critical tool for the United States, which I strongly support. But I would caution the administration in tying the DFC too closely to US-China competition. And we saw with the Millennium Challenge Corporation's experiences in Nepal and Sri Lanka, giving the impression that our development efforts are intended to counter China paints a big target on the backs of our work and can be counterproductive. So for my questions, uh, Mr. Her Herkowitz, uh, you testified that the DFC is working on improving its overall capabilities and recognizing, organizing its structure to counter the Belt and Road Initiative. The DFC is, first and foremost, a development agency. I understand the pressures to finance projects that provide alternatives to the PRC, but in doing so, the DFC cannot lose sight of the development mandate that the law requires. How do you view your role as the Chief Development Officer in ensuring the DFC doesn't lose sight of its development mandate? So let me start by saying that I'm really pleased of the direction that DFC's taken and the progress that it's made over the last few years in terms of making sure that every single project that we do is evaluated for its development impact. And development impact and, and, and strategic interests tend to be mutually reinforcing as well. And so when we look at every project, uh, it's evaluated using a, a system that, that gives it different values depending on how many people are going to benefit, whether it's innovative, whether it's going to promote uh, economic growth. It happens with every single project. And I've watched the quality of those projects from a development standpoint increasingly improve. I see us reaching into areas that are tougher places to work. I, I view DFC's mandate to be, yes, to counter influence of PRC and other malign influence, 
but, but it's also to make sure that we're reaching some of the most underserved populations. And why is that important? Why do countries swing back and forth from left to right in Latin America? I spent 12 years living in Latin America. I've lived in South America, Central America. I've lived in Nicaragua. I've lived in the Caribbean. Why do they do it? Because they're not necessarily catering to the populations who are underserved who vote for their presidents. And as they see that they are left behind, they continue to vote in the other direction. And that's just basic politics. And so what DFC is doing is looking at how we can reach the underserved populations in a lot of these countries, whether it's indigenous groups or Afro-descendant populations in South America, to make sure that we see greater stability and that people get jobs. And we're not dealing with as many people want to migrate across the border to the US. Creating jobs and making sure that people are happy where they are is what creates stable trading sure. partners for us. No, and I'm encouraged to hear that. I'm encouraged with many of the projects that DFC has taken on. Uh, but I, I just want to reiterate that the main mission of the DSC is not to be reactionary to China. Uh, that's not the main mission of the DFC. And the danger there is that we start following what China does and only investing in countries where China is making a play, so to speak. Uh, and I, I don't want us to get to that point. Uh, but let me, let me move on to my second question. Uh, during the last Congress, I led an effort with my colleagues on this committee to change how equity appropriations of the DFC are scored so we can tre treat equity appropriations fairly and unlock more resources. I was glad to see this proposal raised by Secretary Blinken at the budget hearing earlier this year. Uh, what would changing how equity appropriations are treated do to help the United States development priorities and provide alternatives to PRC financing? I think most people in this room agree that the equity authority that was given to DFC was a great new authority, but that we haven't been able to deploy it for reasons that nobody anticipated. And that has to do with how equity is scored, um, which means that when we make an equity investment, it gets treated as if it's a grant. And it's assuming that we're going to lose all that money. And everybody knows that's not the case. When you make an equity investment, it's often you get the greatest return of any type of investment. Solving this issue is going to, would, have, would have a dramatic impact. First of all, it would allow us to get involved in, in, in I'm going to mention the strategic first, strategic projects where there's a lot of risk, whether it's mining or geothermal projects. There's a lot of upfront sunken costs where people don't want to give them loans. And you need to be able to get that equity in there and demonstrate some success over time. But it's also designed to help reach those small businesses, those entrepreneurs who have the good ideas, who can't go to a bank right away. And if you can give a sure. small amount of, of equity to them, that helps them grow their business. Uh, I, I apologize. I've run out of time. I know other people want to ask their questions. But thank you so much for your answers. I yield back. Joe Neal, the uh, chair recognizes Mr. Hill. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. And it certainly echoes the work we do over on House Financial Services Committee as well in trying to strategize and, and work collectively with our, our friends here on the House Foreign Affairs on countering uh, Belt and Road. And one of the key things is China not being a member of the Paris Club is just not an acceptable reality. We need uh, those of you engaged at, uh, in the Foreign and Commercial Service and at state advocating that in the uh, interagency to really press the U.S. to press uh, China uh, to join the Paris Club for debt restructuring so we have fewer Ecuadors, fewer Sri Lankas, uh, fewer catastrophic situations. Uh, I don't want to belabor that fact, but we know about the predatory uh, uh, loan process of China. We know about their lack of transparent lending, their predatory terms, uh, and all these things are things that this Congress have been active on. Uh, my Chinese Debt Transparency Act was signed into law in 2020. Uh, Young Kim's bill, uh, PRC is not a developing country act, passed uh, the House in March. So we are taking actions to counter this. Uh, but we need to build a consensus within the U.S. government, American business, and our pal allies and partners around the world on how best to counter it. And uh, uh, on the House Intelligence Committee, I work uh, in, in my area of geography. I work in, in Africa. And I was on a CODEL to the Republic of Congo in 2017. And everywhere we went in that little place corner of the world, where we only have 14 people in our embassy, by the way, you see millions of dollars worth of Chinese construction. Uh, they built elaborate concrete bridges, freeways, sporting complexes, and even the presidential palace and the foreign ministry building. 
and we were directed, oh, go up this beautiful highway. And we did. We drove this highway. It goes to this major new Chinese-built construction project of our community college. And we, we come to the end of the road because the road is just purely a Potemkin Village fake concrete freeway, and it goes to this beautiful campus from the distance. You see these white buildings on the green camp, a green hillside, and guess what? It's, there's nothing there. They're just empty concrete buildings built by China. There are no students. There's no teachers. There's nothing. There's not even a Chinese restaurant in the country. I mean, they left nothing except deteriorating concrete that, as you know, you wouldn't uh, have uh, in any way, shape, or form. So in addition to predatory terms of Belt and Road, the construction techniques are bad. So what are we doing to, uh, with uh, countries in the global south to inform them? What are you doing in your daily work to inform the countries in the global south about the dangers of financing things from China and using Chinese construction companies? Who wants to start out on that? Congressman, I can start with that one and just to say both in my former ambassadorial role but also knowing what my colleagues around the world are doing, one of our most powerful weapons on that kind of advocacy that you've described are our ambassadors who are on the ground every single day making exactly that point and bringing to the table the better offer uh, that Secretary Blinken talks about all the time. And, and thank you for raising the, the debt issue. And I, I would cite an example right next door to where you were in DRC in Zambia a reforming government um, that has not been able to extract concessions um, from the PRC on its debt overhang. And if you will excuse one more example from Guyana, uh, which I mentioned to Congressman Davidson just a minute ago. Um, when, I was in, when I was in Georgetown, there too you have an airport that was built by the Chinese. Uh, it was so shoddy that the president actually went out to the airport and was pointing out all of the defective air conditioning and jetways and other problems. They also built the, um, the building that the parliament meets in. So we, we have an adversary there. But I was also very encouraged because today it's Bechtel that's developing the construction plants for the new highways and the new ports and the new the, the new uh, Thank you. Let me, let me just in my remaining time uh, do... Do all of you support an all of the above energy strategy for financing by U.S. government financing arms? Yes we, or no? Do you support nuclear financing? Yes. Do you support oil and gas financing? So we, we support whatever project is appropriate for the situation in a country, and that's what we look at. And we, we're market driven, and we're financing fossil fuel projects. We're looks, looking at nuclear, we change our nuclear policy, we're looking at nuclear policy. We also look at geothermal, solar, Sure, hydro. I'm not saying look that. At, yeah. we, we look but at the, what so is So you support an all the above energy strategy for multilateral uh, assets of the U.S., how we participate in the... So, so for, for us, we're generally supporting, uh, you know, IPP, you know, independent power projects. So we look at whether this project is going to be commercially viable and whether it makes the most sense for the country. So we, we financed a gas project in Sierra Leone just two years Thank ago. you. If you have other thoughts on that, I'd like you to respond in writing. And my time's yeah. expired, and I thank the chairman for his large yes. Uh, gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimonies this, this afternoon. Um, in light of the potential fiscal year 2024 operations bill, if uh, there are cuts, draconian cuts, to our foreign assistance by $18 billion, 30%, can you share with me how that will affect your outlook and um, what challenges we'll be confronting in your operations in Africa? Congressman, I'll, I'll just say we, we've just begun that conversation at the State Department, but there will be a severe impact, including a negative impact on our ability to engage in the competition with China that we've been talking about this afternoon. Can you be specific in which regions, if we had to look at a 30 percent cut, um, where would we divest ourselves of, where would we concentrate, reallocate our resources uh, in light of the potential cut? This is on the table now. This is realistic that it's uh, being proposed to have a 30% cut? Congressman, as far as I know, on the State Department side, we have not begun that rack and stack exercise. But as I mentioned earlier, we had a presentation yesterday from Senator Coons 
um, and Senator Graham, which made very clear that this would be this would have a significant impact on the effectiveness of our diplomacy. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? Thank you, Congressman. I would just say that uh, we don't have a specific answer for you on that point, but I do know that that is something we would have to consult very closely with our colleagues at the State Department, and particularly with respect to the operations of our foreign field. Um, in terms of DFC, any reduction in our budget is going to impact our ability to make investments. It's going to impact our ability to have more people overseas and to invest overseas as well. So it will have a, any reduction will have a direct impact. Thank you so much. So as we're talking about as their influence grows and we are entertaining the possibility of reducing our ability to give you funding, um, let's think of a blue sky. What would you like to see the funding level increase to to give you all the tools and support that you need to attract U.S. business? And for my personal travels in Africa and experiences, they would love to do business with Americans, but we haven't extended the hand, shall we say, they've not been a priority. And under a previous administration, we didn't fund the embassies, we didn't staff them, and many people in the continent were left with no other choice. How do we make up time and lost ground? So, Congressman, I'll, I'll thank you for the question, and I'll give you a specific response in the case of the State Department and the ENR Bureau. The President's budget proposal includes $35.5 million for programs in the area of critical minerals and all our ability to compete in that space, and a lot of that resource would go to Africa. Uh, because that's where so many of the minerals are. Anyone else like to comment? Thank you. I yield back my time, Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Baird. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for being here today. Appreciate your uh, comments. You know, the CCP's Belt and Road, and we've been talking about that all evening, has led to a tremendous amount of Chinese influence in Africa including the countries of Kenya, Namaiwe, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Congo, and many more. So the Chinese have made it clear that Africa is a key part of their BRI, and they leverage investments backed by collateral and com commitments that is implemented in such a way that it's almost poss impossible to repay. And, you know, this impacts American agriculture and American production because what they are doing in these countries is trying to gain access to the land and the production uh, of food. Uh, and so that impacts the American agriculture. And on top of that, uh, they, they have built uh, four military ports in 2022, and they didn't have any in 2021. So this is an obvious attempt for China to expand its military presence. So my question is this. Eight out of ten of these countries that are afforded the highest levels of Chinese diplomatic partnerships are eligible for AGOA, the African Growth Opportunity Act. So my question is, what, is it, what are we doing, what's the administration doing to effectively counter Chinese involvement with these countries that have duty-free access to the U.S. market. You want to start? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I know that the administration is uh, taking a very close look at uh, AGOA, but that is a question that I would defer to my colleagues at USTR. One of the most important things that DFC has been doing, in my opinion, has been the growth of its um, food security and agriculture portfolio. When I arrived at DFC a few years ago, we had very, very few deals. We've now grown our portfolio to be doing almost a billion dollars of transactions that have been approved in the last three years. And most of those transactions are benefiting smallholder farmers. And when you have smallholder farmers who are getting access to credit, it puts them in a position also to push back on the influence of, of others who are going to come and try to buy their land. So, so I'm actually really quite proud of the work that DFC has been doing to support smallholder farmers throughout Africa and all over the world. Anyone else? 
My next question then uh, focuses on the the, uh, the digital Silk Road, and you know China's involvement in Africa. That Huawei's got what, 70 percent of the 4G network, and um, and so I think it's important that we counteract some of their activities there. So I just ask how the department is monitoring the supply chain to ensure that uh, American components do not end up in products which ultimately end up used uh, to spy on African citizens. Congressman, maybe, maybe I'll take that one and, and again refer back to my experience as a chief of mission overseas. Um, and the work that we did during the Trump administration to really raise consciousness uh, uh, regarding the vulnerabilities that some of Huawei's 5G systems bring along um, and the ability that our embassies overseas have had uh, to bring in the technical experts who can have the conversations with the intelligence counterparts, with the telecommunications executives, um, but it also comes back to the point of having a competitive alternative product. And, and it's not in my ENR responsibilities today, uh, but I am uh, quite aware that there's significant effort across the U.S. government uh, to figure out how we um, bring American and Western alternatives to the table to compete, including in this space around advanced telecommunications. So, so I, I just wanted to add that while while the PRC has extremely competitive with Huawei and that type of equipment, which is problematic for us, I mentioned the project that we supported working with the Australians and the Japanese in, the, in Papua New Guinea. We did a project in Brazil, the Smart Rio transaction, where we're helping build out smart cities that will provide some level of, of uh, digitization and Wi-Fi access using non-PRC equipment. Uh, and then we're doing a lot of work with data centers as well. In, in Africa, we provide a $300 million loan to Africa data centers because where you store all that data, it's increasingly important that that's secure in a way. And so, so we're, that's another area of growth for DFC. Thank you, and uh, my time is up. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields, the chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for their patience going through all those roll calls and waiting here and uh, still here. Uh, to provide us some insight. I really appreciate that. Uh, there's been, this has been gone over before in some respects, but I think it's important to emphasize too. Uh, I agree with the comments before that we're not there the way that, uh, uh, when I talk to our allies and, and Africa in particular, and talk to them, they said, you just, we want you to be our partners, you're not there. Uh, and, but if we're gonna put a, a, you know, if we're gonna be there and we're gonna uh, put ourselves on the field, you have to fund a team. Uh, and I'm concerned about, and, and I don't think it's all the Republican members here, but there are Republican proposals uh, that went through that would have had the effect of 22% budget cut on USAID, Commerce, State Department. Uh, and if you could briefly just say, the Chinese aren't cutting their uh, uh, investment that, by that amount in terms of doing this that this really puts us at a competitive de de disadvantage that we have to deal with. So without going into too much detail, that's a, that cut would really hamper what you're trying to do uh, overall uh, in, in uh, continents like Africa and the countries there, correct? Severely. Yeah. And, and I think that's, if we're gonna be competitive, we have to fund the team on the ground. Uh, but we do have advantages. Uh, you know, the Chinese with their plans besides uh, the predatory loans, uh, promises of local employment, and then bringing in their own people. In the macro sense, they're coming out with a lot of uh, uh, profits out of this. They are, in effect, uh, taking the rare earth, the minerals, shipping them, and the rest of the processing is being done elsewhere. So in fact, they're probably leaving those countries with 20% of the profit they could get. The U.S., on the other hand, with the efforts that, that you're working on, we want to uh, really try and encourage growth in the country. So these other types of manufacturing, these other kinds of processing, the, the other parts of their economy will benefit. And they could probably get like 80% instead of 20%. So we're gonna be successful if we ha have the tools to do it, I believe, uh, and we should never forget that. Uh, China has certain advantages, but so do we. 
and, and I think we're dealing from a stronger position and hopefully we'll take advantage of that. The biggest advantage we have uh, among uh, the fact that we view uh, the ability of them to profit better themselves as countries and benefit their own people is, is the fact that we have a, something the Chinese don't have. We have a coalition. And we're seeing the coalition in play now in the military sense in Europe. We're seeing it expand beyond Europe, over 50 countries uh, with our involvement in Ukraine. Chinese don't have that. So if you could briefly, the importance of teaming up, particularly with the EU, because with the EU and the US together, that's over half the world's GDP. Instead of sanctioning China, instead of trying to compete with them in a uh, micro sense, we should be dealing with strength. And that's our greatest strength together with our own shared values. Do you want to comment on that? So, uh, Congressman, you really delivered my talking points in so many ways in that presentation, but just let me highlight your last one in particular, which is the advantage that we have in terms of our ability to build coalitions. That's exactly what we are doing through the Mineral Security Partnership, 12 other countries plus the, the European Union. And it's not, just, it's not just Europeans, it's Japan, right. it's Korea, it's Australia, it's Canada. So these are all countries that bring to, that bring to the table the values that we hold in common. And in fact, the first thing that we agreed on as an MSP coalition are a set of environment, social, and governance standards. Those ESGs are public, they're on the internet. Um, but we're also agreed to work together to bring together the resources of our development finance institutions and then also to mobilize our private sectors. And I, I'm not sure if you were here when I made the point earlier that when we started the MSP with Secretary Blinken and Rita Joe Lewis. I was, I'm running out of time. Yeah, it's all stuff. 300%. There. But the other things the State Department are working for uh, a rule of law, stability. That's what's going to encourage private investment. They're going to want those things in, in place right. if they're going to invest private funds. Lastly, just a, if, if you can get a time for response, perhaps, but an observation that's important now with a uh, Russia's illegal war in Ukraine, this war will be over someday. Uh, Ukraine will have the second strongest military probably in Europe. Uh, the work we do in state there is going to be so critical uh, in terms of having them have a country uh, with a civil, civil strength, a rule of law going forward. Uh, in the absence of that, China said they're prepared to invest in reconstruction after the war is over. We have to be there uh, first. Do you think that uh, those statements uh, attributed to some Chinese uh, officials, that they will be prepared to come in after the war is over and invest in that reconstruction uh, presents a real challenge? So, Congressman, we could have a whole separate hearing on this. As you know, I was ambassador in Ukraine from 2013 to 2016. I'm enormously proud of the role the U.S. has played. Um, and I, having spoken with a prime minister, a deputy prime minister, <coughs> the United States is the preferred <coughs> partner by far in the reconstruction process. And we will talk about that with our allies and partners next week on Tuesday and Wednesday when I join Secretary Blinken at the London Ukraine Recovery Conference. Thank you all for your service. I yield back. So, Neil, right. let me just uh, say that we are uh, working on a bill that would use uh, frozen Russian Federation assets to help fund the reconstruction. So. With that, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. i just start by number one saying, I think it's naive to think that China is just building cheap things to put people in their pocket. Uh, I consider this much more long-term. I think they're looking to recreate the road system. Where they didn't have inroads, they're creating roads, whether it be through China and Pakistan or through Sri Lanka or to many places in Europe. This is for the long-term. They're looking to be embedded into resource countries because that is what they do. They export a tremendous amount of, of refined goods, of, of, of value-added goods. And for the long term to do that, they need those resource countries feeding them. They're not trying to do something to say, hey, uh, we're going to get you for a couple of years. So in that, let me ask you all a question. What the, the, the various MOUs that these countries have signed across the Belt and Road Initiative what countries have you seen leave the Belt and Road Initiative after their MOUs expired? So, Congressman, one example is in Europe with the 17 plus one, which last time I checked, I think is the 14 plus one, and it's on the way to becoming the none plus one. Um, which so, ones? Which countries? 
Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't want to give you the wrong data. But what uh, do you think they are? This is important information. Which ones do you think they are? So it's, the 17 plus one was a corridor of countries up and down Central and Eastern Europe. And a series of the 17 plus one partners have basically decided this is not a profitable avenue that they want to pursue, in part because of a lot of consistent diplomacy by American and other officials saying this is inconsistent with our values and interests. Yeah. Uh, so let's continue on that in part. What countries do you see joining in 2023? I hope zero. But I'm asking for a real assessment, not a hope. What are the, um, Congressman, if you're asking, what are the places where I think we need to? I'm asking specifically, what countries do you think join in 2023? So let Very me, specifically. I, Congressman, let me try to be responsive in this way. I would cite an example of Pakistan, a country highly vulnerable because of years of indebtedness to China, um, and a country which is looking for engagement, including from the DFC, well, where DFC. Doesn't Pakistan already have an MOU? Yes, they do, and they have, a, they have a port which is not producing value for them, which the Chinese have constructed. They also have those roads that you described. So who are they adding in 23? Pakistan's already on the list. As I said, I think the, our goal would be that that universe continues to shrink as it is shrinking in the reduction of the 17 plus one. Can you tell me, I wanna dig a little bit into some of these MOUs, which ones do you worry about being able to be weaponized. They build a port, they build a train, they build a road, they build a tremendous amount of infrastructure projects, um, you know, thousands, literally. Which one of those do you believe can be weaponized or are you most concerned about being weaponized, being able to translate to military capabilities? When I was ambassador in Greece, I was very concerned about the PRC presence in the port of Piraeus, in particular because of the critical role that NSA, Naval Base Suda Bay plays as part of our military force projection uh, platform in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and also because of the vulnerabilities that Greece was suffering from when I arrived as a heavily indebted country that nearly fell out of the Eurozone. Uh, we dealt with that, including in partnership with the DFC, but also with a lot of persistent American diplomacy working in lockstep with our European allies. Let me ask uh, a reform question. And this is, of course, open to any of you. All of this has been open to any of you. Anything that I asked that you have an answer to that I didn't get an answer to, please feel free to chime in. Uh, do you think that we should be encouraging reform at the IMF or the World Bank to respond better to the way China is getting countries to participate in, in the Belt and Road? There's fundamentally different approaches between the way the IMF and the World Bank approach building infrastructure and how China does. Do you think there should be reform within the IMF and the World Bank? Congressman, this is really a U.S. Treasury issue, but I will just say uh, I have heard Secretary Yellen speak eloquently about the need for reform at the MDBs. Okay. Congressman, I would just, <clears throat> I would just add the one area of reform I would highlight is in the World Bank where uh, we've been working very closely uh, with them to change their approach uh, to uh, infrastructure development. Give us those changes before my time ends, please. Oh, yeah, so particularly with respect to factoring in uh, value, the life cycle cost um, for uh, uh, infrastructure projects, so that it's not just based on lowest cost, but it's based on an overall cost, which is what creates better advantage for American companies. Thank you for the time, Chairman. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for your patience in staying with us today. Ambassador Pyatt, our, col our colleges and universities are among our greatest assets in our strategic competition with China, helping us win hearts and minds by bringing talented young people from around the world to study in the U.S., and not only do we educate them, but they learn our culture, they make friends, they build lifelong ties to our country and our way of life. Yet, I was recently on a co-del to Japan, an ally that has uh, now increasing importance in light of China's military aggression. And we learned that Japanese students are no longer coming to the U.S. to go to school for a variety of reasons, including the high cost of our colleges and our universities. What steps uh, is the administration taking 
to encourage more foreign students to choose to study in the U.S. instead of China? So, Congresswoman, uh, this one also is out of my ENR lane, but it's very much in my role as a U.S. ambassador that I had in the past. Um, I am a, I agree with you completely. I am a huge fan of every cent that we invest in our educational partnerships. I think the Fulbright program is one of the most uh, lucrative developments that the U.S. has ever committed to in terms of how we build partnerships around the world because you're investing in future generations. Uh, I know that all of my colleagues at the State Department today who work on these issues are, are critically focused on uh, continuing to open these opportunities in the United States. And I also know because I've been part of the preparations for Prime Minister Modi's visit um, that we will use that visit as well to highlight uh, the tremendous example that India provides of a country that's sending lots of students uh, to, uh, to the United States. I would also say, as a parent um, uh, who's finished paying for university for two children, I and mean, as somebody who's watched the role of international education, that I see tremendous value also in having more American students be given the opportunity to study overseas. Since you brought up the issue of India, uh, I wonder if you can comment on whether it's become more difficult for students uh, who study at our colleges to get immigration visas to stay and work in the U.S. after they graduate. Do you think this is a disincentive for foreign students to come to the U.S.? Um, Congressman, I'm going to I'm going to punt that one uh, to my colleagues in the SCA Bureau who work on these issues every single day. But I, I do know, and on this I can I can speak for Secretary Blinken and the rest of the administration. Uh, there is a very, very strong commitment to continuing to build those educational partnerships because they contribute to American economic competitiveness. Thank you. Mr. Herskowitz, how can DFC help provide financing to more companies that offer loans to help foreign students study at our colleges and universities? So, so DFC actually has some active projects that provide um, loans to help people uh, uh, finance graduate education, including in the United States. So this is, a, we have existing projects in that regard. We have to be careful, obviously, that we're not giving opportunities to people that, that we might not otherwise provide to Americans as well. So we're very careful about when we do these types of projects to make sure that they're targeting the right populations of people who, who also, with the ultimate goal of, of coming back to their home country, so that they're going to help develop the local expertise and we don't promote a brain drain in those countries. Okay, understood. Uh, Ambassador Pyatt, what is the State Department doing to help other countries take steps to guard against China's growing influence over foreign think tanks, academia, Confucius Institutes, and media outlets? So again, Congressman, Congresswoman, this is, this is one where I will speak in my capacity as a, a former ambassador, because I dealt with exactly these issues in Greece. Um, where we worked very hard, including private conversations that I had with senior university leaders, raising the concerns that we had around um, some of the Confucius Institutes and the way in which the Chinese, the PRC embassy was seeking to some extent to, uh, to um, limit academic freedom. It's a core principle of the United States, the open exchange of ideas but we want to compete on a level playing field. It's exactly the same principle that applies to the economic and commercial issues that all of us work on. Thank you. I have more questions, but we have a baseball game to get to, so <laughs> I, I yield back. Thanks for reminding us. Uh, General Lady Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Mills. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I wanted to go through my understanding of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's something that I had written on for, for many years, and I've published you know, dozens of articles on the ideas of the, also the geopolitical alignments that are involved in this when we talk about Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, and what their overarching goal is, which we know is to eliminate the U.S. dollar as a global currency. But we're seeing where you've already got an expansion of Eurasia, which is one of the key elements that they were looking for, that they're continuing to try and utilize the proxy of Russia to be able to try and advance for them. You already have a tremendous amount of growth when it comes to Africa and the economic coercion that was undermining a lot of the U.S. security cooperations and others. And then you see the continual strengthening in Oceania, which is really an idea of trying to choke off Western Hemisphere supply chain. And then that marriage of convenience that they currently have, we know helps them a lot in our own hemisphere. When we talk about the Chavez of Venezuela, when we talk about Pedro and Colombia, when we talk about that Russian involvement, as, we, as I mentioned. But they also have now Panama and Honduras, 
whereby they're going to continue to utilize these relationships to potentially look at the uh, promotion of increased taxes, tariffs, and passageway when it comes to the canal. So there's almost an encirclement attempt uh, with conjunction of a further type of uh, malign activity regarding WHO and WF and how they utilize those, but also attacking the petrodollar with OPEC to try and see if they can supplement it and or replace it. And so when you know that these are a lot of the strategies, and, and we have been in an economic resource and cyber-based warfare with China for quite a long time. We continue to try and refer to it as competition, which is why it kind of disturbs me slightly when I hear something like what you stated earlier about Sullivan saying that we should de-risk and not decouple, because I do think that we do have opportunities to be able to not only protect America and get back control of our economic and supply chain capabilities, but also to really thrust China into an economic uh, collision, because if you look, they're in far worse position than we are when it comes to debt. They just aren't allowing their valuations to be properly audited that would actually disclose a lot of these things. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned with a lot of the things that we're doing that doesn't seem to be in line with us actually trying to save America and more on a China first agenda when it comes to this administration when we talk about the significant importance of energy dominance. And meanwhile, one of the first things that was done was to cut the Keystone XL pipeline. You know, when we talk about the ideas of economic warfare, and yet we haven't recognized yet that it's not the dollar or the bot or the dinar or the ruble. The common global currency is energy. And I'm just not seeing where this administration is really grasping that understanding. Now, I would argue that we have a lot of things, and Chairman Xi has said it himself, that he can outpace us militarily and economically, but his biggest fear is America's innovation. And I think that we have opportunities, as we all know, to advance ourselves and almost treat the quantum race the same way that Reagan treated the space race when it came to helping to bankrupt. Again, looking at the ideas of quantum entanglement, AI autonomous drone capabilities, but also the ideas that we know they control 15 of the 16 rare earth mineral mines but we don't even explore the ideas of subsurface harvesting, where you actually have the ability to take the 100% manganese control out of the Chinese hands by actually utilizing that at the 10,000 to 12,000 meter depth levels, something we have a capability of doing, but also would refocus China's attention. Because if we decouple, the way to hurt China, because they want to get into a non-kinetic element of things, they don't want to go gun to gun with us. They want us to basically go ahead and collapse ourselves financially which means that they essentially have won by not only buying up our lands and controlling the farmlands, but controlling us and our behaviors. So I wanted to know whether or not we feel that energy dominance, getting to a point of reliable, not just the race for renewables where we buy a lot of the materials from China, and the ideas of subservice harvesting, quantum race, and these types of elements where we understand that decoupling and hurting China economically is far, far more superior than anything else, is something that you would agree with. So, Congressman, I said, I think in the opening sentence of my statement that I see my job in ENR's role as to ensure that the United States continues to be the partner of choice around the world on issues of energy and energy security. Um, we had that status during the fossil fuel era, and we are now working as hard as we can to ensure that that remains the case as um, we enter this area of technological change. We see more work being done in areas ranging from small modular reactors to green hydrogen to geothermal to wind and solar and all the other technologies that will... Those are more re renewables over reliables. I mean, when we look at the actual impacts of things, but also where the actual sources are originating. I mean, again, we know cobalt, nickel, and lithium, especially after we gave $1.1 trillion in lithium to the Chinese with the handover of Afghanistan, doesn't work in our favor, but we do have LNG, we do have natural gas, we do have the ideas of, of drilling more and actually getting resource harvesting. And this cash diplomacy effort that the USAID and OTI, where we think we can buy our adversaries with $800 million or uh, uh, you know, whatever the case may be for Pakistan or the others, has shown not to work. But what has worked is the model that Germany and Russia have, whereby you actually provided reliable, cost-effective energy sources and that gained a lot of alliance, especially for those countries that were moving away from their own productivities of coal and nuclear, et cetera. So I don't think that the strategy that we're utilizing, if the idea is to understand that we're looking to try and be the prevented, uh, uh, prevent China's expansion and actually get to a point of being the global dominant, I don't think the idea is trying to de-risk our involvement, but decouple away from the economic reliancy 
on China. And so I don't think that preventing clean energy dominance is necessarily the only mechanism. It's actually utilizing and supplying our own internal energy when it comes to oil and fossil fuels and the things that we need to be able to be dominant to the point where that's our recognized strengths. And so I'm sorry when I disagree with the solar power projects that majority of this isn't made in America. And we're not in competition with China. We're in economic resource warfare with China. And we need to acknowledge that and stop trying to hide away from it. Thank you for the additional time, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Gentleman <coughs> yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Moscovich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so, I don't know, about a month ago now, I got back from uh, Egypt, Italy, Israel, and Jordan uh, with the Speaker of the House. And we talked a lot about China and a number of these countries. We talked about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and I, I have a specific question for you all, but I want to I want to build it up for a second. So, you know, we learned about obviously what China is trying to do in Egypt, what China with the Belt and Road Initiative in Italy. Uh, we talked about uh, China and Israel's technology. We talked about how China is winning contracts through procurement. And as I was sitting and listening to all of these things and getting educated, what I what I recognized is that. One of the significant challenges we have in this fight with China is that the American people know none of this. They know none of it. They don't know that China is on its way to taking control of the African continent through whatever, through, through loans, through dollars, you know, through 5G, whatever, which way. They, they, don't, they don't know that we're starting to hear from countries that we can't sell them weapons fast enough because either we can't get them approved or we can't get them manufactured. And so, you know, China is an option. They don't know that when China, when, when the United States pulls back, China comes in. They, they, they don't know that. They don't know that Chinese workers are around the world building projects in other countries. They, they have no idea. And you know how I know they have no idea? Because I had no idea until I started learning about it through this committee and through talking to other people. You, you don't, so what I want to ask you guys is, as we have this huge debate in this country on whether we should pull back from, uh, from the world, how do, we, how do you look at how we're going to get the American people to understand that every time we pull back, China comes in, and what that is going to result in in the future? And that's for all of you or any of you. So, Congressman, let me start out by just thanking you for raising the issue and, and pointing out the concern. Because I think there's a, a fundamental principle that I've learned over the course of my diplomatic career, which is that when the United States pulls out and isn't someplace, bad things happen. Um, we have learned that history over various, ver we've learned that lesson over various times in American history. Um, I, I hope very much we won't have to learn it again. And, and I think the burden is on all of us whether in Congress, in the administration. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but it, it's happening, though. It's happening. One of the, one of the issues we heard um, from the leaders in the Middle East is that Ukraine is very important. They're happy with our position. They're supporting our position. They understand the repercussions, um, not, not just in Europe, but other places, if we were to leave that area and let Russia just take Ukraine. But they were deeply concerned that while we were, you know, asking them not to, you know, uh, listen to the Chinese, they were deeply concerned that we're taking our eye off the ball in Africa or we're taking our eye off the ball in the Middle East because the United States is having problems of walking and chewing gum at the same time. So I, I would just say this is why Secretary Blinken is constantly reminding us to keep our focus on Roe, the rest of the world. Um, and I think especially in an environment where so many of the challenges to American security and the, the, the safety and security of American citizens um, are coming not only from countries now, but from transnational challenges, whether that is um, climate change, energy insecurity, um, pandemics and, and disease, food insecurity. All of these issues ripple across global markets. I, I'm glad to hear you were in I Egypt because that's a perfect example of a country that's sort of a, a petri dish for all of these different forces, but which where the government is looking to engage with the United States and is looking for strong partnership. Yeah, 
Every country we went to, it was clear they would rather do business with us than China. It's not even close, right? It was unequivocal. But the subtext also was that if we can't deliver, they just can't not, they can't do any, they can't not just do anything. They got to buy weapons from somewhere. They got to get loans from somewhere. Um, and, and so, you know, we're having this debate through Ukraine about isolationism. You know, we should spend our money here. We shouldn't spend it over there. And how do we get the American people to really understand that in this battle with China, right, that every time we're going to pull back or every time we're going to look a different direction, that it's not just bad things are going to happen. We know that it's going to be China who comes in. How do we get the American people to understand that um, when, we're, when we're talking about foreign policy, when that's not on MSNBC every night, it's not on Fox News every night, it's not on social media. How, how, how do we get them to understand this? So, Congressman, I, I guess the only lesson I would offer for my own diplomatic career is actually here in our pockets, and it's this. It's the sense of connectivity that the technology revolution has brought. And, and I think about, for instance, my own involvement with, with India, which goes back to 1992. And what happens when you have hundreds of millions of people who are suddenly connected globally? Um, I, I'm, an, I'm a technology optimist, I think, th and I think the United States will continue to lead um, the creation of value in that technology space. But we also have to recognize um, that we, we are, our economy, our, our prosperity here at home is more tied to the rest of the global system than it has ever been before. And again, my portfolio working on energy, energy transition issues dramatically illustrates this, as the United States is now the largest gas exporter in the world, as the United States will remain a critical center of technological innovation on issues of energy, uh, on <coughs> issues of, of energy transition. I don't thank know. If, uh, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. So, when yields, uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for staying with us this long. You know, as I serve as Chairwoman of the Indo Pacific Subcommittee, uh, it is really important that, uh, you know, we carry on our priorities, uh, not only from the subcommittee, but overall committee to, um, you know, give our allies the tools and resources they need so they can uh, counter the Belt and Road Initiative and other types of economic coercion. And our strategy for countering the Belt and Road Initiative must also include how we can bring the full force of the American private sector to compete with the CCP-owned uh, and affiliated uh, companies. Pacific Islands, for example, it's a very, very essential to the success of uh, Belt and Road Initiative, especially given their strategic importance to the United States and its allies. And combined with our overt uh, political pressure and bribery, the CCP is successfully using the economic leverage over Pacific Islands to achieve their political goals. Um, so most notably, you know, Solomon Islands. They joined BRI in 2019 and uh, severed the, their ties with Taiwan. And last year, they announced a security agreement with PRC that would allow the uh, PLA to station personnel and assets in the Solomon Islands. This is very concerning to me. But uh, Mr. Um, the Herskowitz, um, what projects is... DFC undertaking in the Pacific Islands, and do you coordinate those projects with Foreign Commercial Service? So I mentioned the, the project that we are doing in Papua New Guinea um, in collaboration with the Australians and the Japanese, a $50 million guarantee to upgrade to 5G network there as well. We have someone who's based in Indo-Pacific who travels frequently to the Indo-Pacific Islands. And I actually speak to him on a fairly regular basis because a lot of the transactions in these small in the smaller islands tend to be small mm -hmm. and we're private sector driven. So we're always looking for creative opportunities about how we can make sure that financing goes where it needs to go. In a country with a population of, of, of 100,000, 200,000 people. There aren't the same large scale projects that you might find in other countries. And so we're looking at how we can work potentially with regional development banks to make sure that small businesses are getting the financing that they need as well. I want to I want to continue that and then I want to ask uh, Mr. Venkataraman, uh, can you describe 
the FCS engagement in the Pacific Islands and uh, what are the biggest challenges the American sector uh, faces in engaging in more commercial activity in the Pacific Islands. Yeah, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, uh, we are very focused on shifting the dynamic in our relationship with the Pacific Islands and paying much more attention uh, and bringing American companies to do business in the Pacific Islands. Uh, as we are in other markets, we are out there to make sure that the Pacific Islands see us as the partner of choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as my colleague said, it is a heavy lift. Uh, we are engaged right now. We've uh, staffed. Uh, we have. We added two staff to Fiji and Papua New Guinea. Uh, we are now in the process of negotiating MOUs to strengthen our commercial relationship uh, with a number of the, of the Pacific Islands, uh, and we are looking ahead to additional staffing uh, to see if that would uh, assist the efforts of U.S. companies to get into those markets. However, the problem remains, as my colleague mentioned, the the size of those markets being as small as they are. Uh, in those markets, even more than in other markets, the importance of de-risking mechanisms such as DFC, such as XM, um, cannot be overstated. Mm -hmm. um, American companies um, are always eager to do business where there's opportunity, uh, but where these opportunities don't translate into, into you know, ways that, that make it amenable for them to, to do the deals that they want to do, we have to find ways to bridge that gap. And so Can that's you talk about those, uh, like, changes or additional tools that you will need uh, you know, for the DFC to uh, compete against PRC in those projects and uh, in that region? Yes, so I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to my colleague to, to amplify, but I think the, mm -hmm. the point is that the, the DFC performs such a critical function that our businesses appreciate to take these environments, these economies around the world, and make them accessible to our businesses uh, by virtue of, of the financing that they provide and by virtue of making those projects uh, bankable. And uh, it's, it's a critical role that DFC plays, without which our companies could not engage in most markets in the world, but all the more so in a, in a small market like the Pacific Island country. Yeah. So, so, sorry. So again, DFC takes a market-driven approach. So what we're doing is we're evaluating what is the need in the market and who's willing to invest there. Now, we want to give it a lot of nudging. We want to work with Commerce Department and with others and with our embassies to identify opportunities. And we really look hard at any potential opportunity with frequent travel to the region as well to try to identify opportunities where we can have that private sector investment that the countries want and need. Thank you. Um, my time is expired, so I will yield back. Thanks. Well, he yields thank back, you. and we thank the witnesses for your patience. I know it's been a very long afternoon with that long vote series, but uh, this uh, has been very valuable and very important. Um, you are the counter to the malign influence of China. Uh, we want to work with you, and we want to support you, and we want to get that full equity. Uh, I'll do everything in my power to move that bill out of this committee. And so, again, I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, members may have additional questions uh, in writing. I would ask you to respond. Members have five days to submit statements, questions for the record. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you so much for the timer. And they're all like, it's got the peace book. We're all like, off of, we're, we're great.